We have as our guest here um, Bob Cornuke, an old friend that uh, from our Southern California days, actually, way back, right? Way back. Way back. Bob, why don't you uh, take me off the hook and give him a little of your background as we jump in. Bob, Bob Cornuke is the Indiana Jones, as some people call him, of today. He's an adventurer, explorer, and uh, probably the most uh, prominent uh, guy in the field of contemporary archaeology, especially ones that have a prophetic or biblical uh, relationship, of course. So, uh, Bob, why don't you give him a little bit of your background? Well, thank you for the kind semi-introduction. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, my background is law enforcement. Uh, I, I come from a uh, – I studied criminology at Fresno State University and uh, went into uh, law enforcement and was educated uh, uh, through some FBI means there to do research and to study um, methods of uh, investigation. And I've applied those now in onto studying the Bible and researching the Bible. It's kind of a unique way to look at researching the Bible. It's not a standard way in which people – typically research the Bible. But it's a search for evidence, an evaluation it, it, of evidence, isn't it? It, it, it is a, it's a unique way of ferreting out evidence that has, that has really not been considered until now. We really have gone way back. We travel over to the sites. We travel over to the, uh, the libraries and the museums in foreign countries. We talk with their officials over there. We really spend a lot of time, and, and unfortunately, a lot of scholars just don't have the time or money or desire to go over there and do this kind of hard, brutal work. Uh, they do a fantastic job for the kingdom of God and their and their research that they do do. But unfortunately, a lot of a lot of these scholars are unable to go over and travel and do this kind of investigative research that we do. So it's a lot of on site, a lot of risk. It's very expensive and it's uh, quite uncomfortable most times. I can see why they wouldn't want to do it. But we go over and really work hard to try and find these little shreds of evidence. Uh, you know, as time, like a crime scene, as time goes on, as every year, uh, every millennium goes by, it just becomes fainter and fainter. These pieces of evidence, uh, like at a crime scene, get harder and harder to find and harder to to gather. So it is an arduous task, but uh, we work hard at it, and, and hopefully we've we've found some things that are of interest to people. Now, what was your first real involvement? It was the Sinai thing, the, the, one of the earlier uh, engagements on this whole thing? Actually, it was Noah's Ark. I met a man named Jim Irwin, who was eighth man in Walk on the Moon, the first one to drive the car on the moon, and he he became a very close friend and uh, actually became vice president of the High Flight Foundation in Colorado oh, Springs. Uh-huh. So I was his sort of right-hand man and, and ran the operations there for Jim. And when he came back from the moon, he he had a, a spiritual experience on the moon. A lot of people don't know that while he was up on the moon, he did have an experience, an, an, an epiphany, sort of a he, – he looked at the lunar rover and he looked at all the things that, that were up there that man had accomplished and said, wow, this is the greatest thing that man has accomplished. But he looked up over the horizon of this gray – dusty ball called the moon and he saw the earth suspended in this black vacuum of space and this little droplet of light and white and green and blue and brown this living pulsating a little piece of earth out there and he said this this is not by accident he, he could see he see he had a sense that he was so close to god that he that he was standing on the threshold there of literally the entire universe and eternity and so he he had a he had a real commitment to come back and, and to serve the God that impacted his heart so incredibly on that trip. And part of those uh, things that he did when he came back was to evangelize, and, and he wanted to go and had a great interest to go look for Noah's Ark. He met some people that were involved with looking for Noah's Ark that, that captured his imagination. So he went to look for Noah's Ark, and then a couple of years later he came to me and said, hey, you want to be as crazy as I am and go look for this old boat on a, on a mountain far off over in eastern Turkey? And so I went with him, and uh, uh, boy, you, you, you get the bug. I mean, it's mm-hmm. exciting. There's great fellowship. There's great adventure. I mean, just think of it. You're standing on the skid of a helicopter. The doors are open. The wind is blasting in your face. You're hanging on, and and uh, you're skimming across these icy peaks, and no one's ever taken a helicopter flight around Mount Ararat, and you're thinking any moment that you might see wood or, or remnants of this decaying, um, uh, boat that uh, Noah landed on on a mountain over there. So it was very exciting to be a part of those searches and sort of got the bug, and I'm still doing it today. Well, you brought up Noah's. Let's let's not leave it there. Uh, what your, you've got a whole different take on the Noah's Ark in more recent years, have you not? Well, it, it's like a lot of the research we do, Chuck, is that we we sit back and say, why do people believe this in the first place? Mm-hmm. And you know, if Jim were here today 
and and he's gone to be with the Lord. But if Jim were here today, and, and he he focused in on Mount Ararat in Turkey as being the mountain, which is the uh, traditional it, site. Most people there have been many many expeditions with, with that presumption, hasn't it? I'd say far far the the most majority of you, the vast majority of opinion is that it's on Mount Ararat in Turkey, and um, I have uh, really made a lot of <laughs> ark searchers angry. I think because I've really taken a different tact on this. And as I do with all the research we do, we try to back it up with Scripture. We believe Scripture is uh, historically, prophetically, and contextually accurate. I use the, the Bible as, as a compass, as a roadmap, as a guide to, to uh, try to find these lost locations. And it's fascinating about Noah's Ark is that how did Mount Ararat in Turkey, which everybody talks about as being where Noah's Ark came to rest, how did mm-hmm. it ever get to be called Mount Ararat in the first place? Well, in, a, in about the year 1200, the Armenians had their, their uh, Bible translated into their own language. Um, they were uh, just coming of age, and they read in there where it talked about Mount Ararat being in Armenia. Of course, they were in Armenia. And, and, and at that time, uh, the area north of Lake Van and the area of eastern Turkey, the capital or the region around uh, Lake Van, uh, believed to be the earlier uh, capitals of uh, ancient Armenia and Urartu, um, that was the most logical place. So they just anointed this mountain, and they said, this is Mount Ararat, and this is where the ark came to rest. And, of course, as travelers went through there, as they did, many of them, even Marco Polo even makes reference to going through that area and uh, talking about a mountain called Ararat in that region. It became very popular. And in just the last 100 years, there's been a lot of eyewitnesses that have fueled this tradition that Mount Ararat is the mountain that holds the remains of Noah's Ark. And we've had many, many eyewitnesses, hundreds of eyewitnesses that have come forward, many of them very credible. Uh, but I have spent a lot of time and effort going to these sites and going to them and seeing a rock or seeing a unique uh, uh, formation up there that looks like it could be a barge or square shape, but it turns out to be nothing. It turns out to be merely a shadow or a rock formation or a unique ice formation. A lot of people have said that it's in the glaciers. Well, people don't realize that you know glaciers move at different speed at the lower part of the glacier than the upper part of the glacier, and it causes grinding system. Anything that would be in there in this time would be pulverized because of the action of the glaciers. Um, the Ahura Gorge is the most popular place. This is a, this is a sheer cliff gorge up there that goes up to 15,000 feet. No boat could, could rest in there or survive in there at all. Um, so now we're starting to, to wonder, with all the, researchers that we've, the, all the researchers that we've done over there, I've climbed the mountain. I've flown around the mountain in a helicopter during a high melt year. I was the first one to climb the first uh, expedition helicopter around Mount Ararat in Turkey. And we didn't find anything. I mean, you're, we're talking a boat that's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high when it was made. Those approximate mm-hmm. measurements mm-hmm. on your mm-hmm. interpretation, of course, the cubit and what the cubit is. But that's an approximate estimation. Mm-hmm. It's sure. a very big, big, large wooden barge covered on the inside and outside with a tar material or a pitch. So it add, add to the preservation of it. But nothing was seen up there. And literally, I was in the helicopter going right and skimming over the mountain peaks, looking into every, like a dentist with a drill going over a tooth. <laughs> I mean, I went over every square inch and I didn't see any boat up mm-hmm. there. And after going to all these sites, I really became discouraged that the, that, that the ark was there. And then I started thinking, well, what does the Bible have to say about this? I mean, it's a really unique way to study the Bible is using the Bible as a tool. I, I don't think I've created this, but I think, I think it's what people should do. And Genesis 8.4 gives us our first clue. It says, Then the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And it's very interesting because Scripture clearly points out that it says mountains of Ararat, plural. Uh Well, when you go over to Turkey, you're dealing in the Araxis plain there with one cone mountain coming up. There's another small cone next to it, but cannot hardly even be considered a mountainous region. So for all intents and purposes, it's one cone mountain with just rolling hills around it, and it's not a mountainous kingdom at all. The Bible specifically calls it the mountains of Ararat. It would be a a large Mm -hmm. mountainous Mm -hmm. region, and so we get our first clue from there. And then the Bible says in the waters, in Genesis 8, 5, it says, And the water decreased steadily until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. So we have a situation where it's probably in a mountainous region. Now we know that it's, a, it's probably the highest mountain in the region because the other mountain peaks began to appear several months later after the ark had landfall 
on top of uh, mm-hmm. Mount Ararat. And by the way, there's nowhere in Scripture that says the word Mount Ararat as such. It always says mountainous region or the mountains of Ararat. Now, the next big clue is in Genesis 11.1, 1, and this is the New King James uh, translation. I should point that out because the Bible says, Now the whole earth was one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now that means it would be uh, Babylon, the uh, plain of Shinar, or Shinar, is west of Ararat. Absolutely. It? And, you know, this is clear as day. Well, that, that if, puts this whole thing much further east than most people would. Uh, well, t- well, Ararat in Turkey, the traditional mountain, is northwest of Shinar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not even just north. It's northwest of Shinar. So now if we have Shinar or Shinar, however you want to pronounce it, it being in the region of the Mesopotamia Valley and the descendants migrating from the east, and they have to be original descendants because this is even talking about before Nimrod. So we're dealing with just second generation or third generation, uh, right in the very close after the flood in, in the in the time tales, and they come into here and they move uh, to the Mesopotamia Valley before the Tower of Babel is built. So it's right after the flood. So where would you go look for where Noah's Ark came to rest? But the Bible gives us a compass direction even mm-hmm. on where it is. And this verse is literally ignored by a lot of scholars. Um, then we talk about in Genesis 10, 10, uh, it talks about in the land of Shinar, from that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh. This is talking about Nimrod. Of course, why would he come from Ararat in Turkey, come south all the way to Mesopotamia, and then turn around and go the same direction back and fight to take land going north? From a military strategic standpoint, it's just not logical. So the Bible is very logical, and if we follow what it has to say, it always unlocks these clues. 2 Kings 19.36 says, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nishra, his god, that his sons Adaramelech and Sherezar struck him down with the sword, and they escaped in the land of Ararat. Then Hesard and his son reigned in his place. This is an interesting clue that Scripture gives us because it talks about a time when an Assyrian king, Sennacherib, was having uh, civil disorder in the land that his two sons actually killed him with the sword, and that they escaped into the land of Ararat. So in our research, we went over to the Middle East. We went to the libraries in the Middle East, and we contacted the universities in the Middle East. We tried to find out where was their civil disobedience at the time of Sennacherib and Hesaradan. The only place there was civil, civil disobedience was in the area around Lake Ermia, which is 150 miles south of the region the Ararat region. So we have civil disobedience around the area of the Manny tribes or Lake Ermia, which places it much further south than Mount Ararat in Turkey as to where the region of Ararat should be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then we have in Jeremiah fifty one twenty seven it says, Lift up a signal in the land, blow a trumpet amongst the nations, consecrate the nations against her, summon against her these kingdoms, Ararat, Mini, and Askenaz. The Bible specifically gives us a reference here. It says Ararat is located in close proximity with the Mini and the Askenaz tribes, because it says, blow a trumpet, raise up a standard. It was a very close confederation of nations. These nations were summoned by King Cyrus in the attack against Babylon. Well, if we find Mini and Ashkenaz, we'll surely find the area of Ararat. Well, this is much further south around Lake Ermi area, and just west of the Caspian Sea, where all these kingdoms and federations um, resided, which gives us another location further south and further east of the traditional Mount Ararat in Turkey. We need to broaden our scope of interest in this area because all the arrows point specifically to the east of Shinar in the area west of the Caspian Sea, east of Lake Ermia, and no one has ever researched and gone to that area ever to look for the mountains of Ararat. And where is that today? And today is in uh, terms of geography. What, is that, is that, is that uh, uh, Iran then? Well, it's, it's, it's in the area of northern Iran. Um, it is a, uh, there is a mountainous area there, a huge mountainous area there. Um, it's the northern part of the Zagros. And there's a mountain there that's 16,000 feet. Um, it is the highest mountain in the region, and it's sort of one of these, I don't know why it's been uh, over, overlooked, because it's a very prominent mountain in the area, and it's a huge, there's 600 square miles of mountains around it. Um, another interesting thing is we found over there is that there, there was um, uh, an ancient uh, 
historian called Nicholas of Damascus, and he was a historian for Herod the Great. He had access to all the great libraries. He's the only one in history to specifically give us an inclination as to where the Ark came to rest, a specific location, even though uh, we have uh, Flavius Josephus and Barossus talking about it. They never gave a specific location. And... Um, the Demetrius says it was north, or Nicholas of Damascus says it was north of the Minyas, um, in in a, in a mountain where the Ark came to rest. Well, the Minyas is is we believe to be the Mini tribes or the Mani tribes, which is east of Lake Hermia and west of the Caspian Sea in northern Iran. So we have another indication here that this is the area that we should be searching. Why in the world would no one take a lot of energy to search this when the Bible clearly is pointing? History is clearly pointing that this is the area where the ark came to rest, and it's beyond me why this has not received any attention at all until we've decided to go over there and take a look. Hmm. So you've actually gone into Iran in this mm-hmm. area? We've, gone, we've met with well, the, Tell me about it. That's exciting. Well, we met. I, I've, go, I've been over there three times now, um, rested over there twice. <laughs> uh, it hasn't been easy. We found over there, amazingly... Uh, this area has been excluded because a lot of people said it was never the ancient land of Urartu or Armenia. And as we went over there, we found that they have recently unearthed um, uh, stone monuments specifically saying that this was the er- the land of Urartu. And uh, this was the ancient area of Armenia um, and totally in line with scripture. Um, then we went to the University of Tehran. We talked to several of the professors. Uh, one of the professors and I became very good friends, Dr. Ali, and he told me uh, that he met with the professors, talked about this subject, and that the mountain that we were interested in has an ancient name in Zoroastrian language. And I said, okay, this is the land, this was the mountain that I'm specifically interested in. And I said, uh, what is the name of the mountain? He says, well, it's called Bar Jam Kard. He said, they all looked it up yesterday from the university. And it's called Varjam Kard. And it's the ancient Zoroastrian language. I said, what does it mean? He said, literally? I said, yes, literally. He said, literally it means this is the mountain where Noah landed. This is 500 B.C. This is pretty exciting. You know, let's get your heart going because we have ancient historical documents that precede the tradition in Ararat and Turkey by thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And so now we're very excited about this potential area. Then we found out from the University of Tehran that this was considered to be the original capital and the northern slopes going up to the river Araxis was the original capital of Urartu. And so now we have this as being perfect. This is the area that the Bible is talking about. Everything is pointing to this area and nothing really has anything to, to suggest it for the Mount error at tradition other than it's just a great tradition. So, uh, of course, a lot of people have put a lot of time and money in that mountain, and they're going to be a little upset because I'm coming up with all this new information. But uh, the Bible cannot be ignored here. History cannot be ignored here. And we need to refocus our attention to the proper area. If we're ever going to find the remains of Noah's Ark or not, and I don't know if we're going to find, I mean, you know, here we're talking a long time ago, but we just recently came back from England where we filmed wood from Fen Fen from a thing called Seahenge that was 4,000 50 years old, and it was perfectly preserved. Under the right conditions, wood could last an extremely long time. High on a mountain, on the north side, covered with pitch inside and out, who knows? Maybe under the right conditions, God is preserving it for his time, for his purpose, and his glory. But so far, there's been no tangible evidence other than in, in terms of... This doesn't show up on uh, satellite photography or, no. or anything like that. But TV has been very uh, liberal in their interpretation of the wood being found. And it's very confusing to people. Uh, unfortunately, um, on Mount Ararat in Turkey, there have been a lot of police. There have been a lot of uh, videos and television shows that have mm-hmm. been mm-hmm. – portraying that wood has been found. Oh, yeah, and a lot of books written. A lot of books written. And I'd like to say now, for the record, that I've investigated every one of those claims, and none of them are true. Wood has not been founded on Mount Ararat in Turkey. Even on this NBC special, talked about Jim Irwin was thrilled that that they photographed Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, and I went over to the site exactly where he said he saw it. In fact, I was with Jim in the plane at the time, so I think he would have told me about it. But I went to the site where they had a photograph, and it was nothing more than a big rock formation. Uh, the rock formation was just a little bit larger than a school bus, of course, much smaller than what the Ark of Noah would be. But, 
you know, when you get up there, you get pretty excited. You start thinking, you start seeing Noah's Ark everywhere because, uh, <laughs> right. you know, we're talking about a, we're talking about a rectangular shaped object, an object that is, uh, that is barred shaped. And there's a lot of objects that really can fool you until you get right on them. So, uh, I, I can justify that those people are probably well intended, but, but the real research has indicated that there's no wood on Mount Ararat that's ever been discovered. What's the next, what's the next step regarding the Ark of Noah in your mind? Well, uh, as, as always, it's, it's a matter of I go back there every year and, and uh, ra- raising the money to do this. Uh, some people feel that this would be the greatest discovery in archaeological history, that it would change how people look at evolution creation. Other people think that it's foolishness and they can't understand why I would do this. Of course, the Bible specifically says the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God for their foolishness and he can't understand them because they are spiritually discerned. There are those out there that will look at Noah's Ark and certainly see it's foolish. There are those that will see the Bible and certainly th- see that it's foolish. But there's also those that would see that this was a historical event, and this happened in history. In fact, we read in history from 3,800 years ago, there was an ancient list that was discovered which speaks of eight kings who, eight kings who reigned before the Great Flood, which swept over them. Uh, we know from 3,600 years ago, the Sumerians wrote, Sumerians wrote of a great flood and man's survival on a boat. From 3,600 years ago, the Atrakasis epic speaks of a great flood and animals who entered a boat as a fierce storm rages. And from 4,500 years ago, uh, a famous ancient king from Akkad named Namrum Sin reported a deluge of water that happened at an early time of mankind. So we have these ancients that are writing about mm-hmm. this event as if it was history. And of course, the university textbooks will selectively prune this out because, of course, they don't want to accept this as historical fact, even though it meets their criteria to be included in historical documents and history books. But since it has to do with the flood, um, they think that it's foolishness and they can't understand it. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, let's uh, shift gears here a little bit. Uh, let's talk about Mount Sinai. That's a uh, that's one that uh, you've had some very unorthodox views on that have pretty well become corroborated, as, as I see it. So uh, let's just uh, let's just jump into the into the, the whole. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody that goes to uh, St. Catherine's Monastery, everyone that everyone knows that the Mount Sinai is on the Sinai Peninsula, obviously, and uh, and yet uh, you've uh, you've been involved with uh, uh, some interesting discoveries there. Why don't you start from the beginning on that one? Well, that's another uh, expedition that started with Colonel Jim Irwin, the Apollo 15 astronaut, and uh, he had been contacted by some Americans that he knew that talked about a scorched mountain peak over there. They actually went over there and got arrested and um, gave this incredible tale about this mountain being over there with altars and pillars around it, and, and, and nobody really took them seriously. Um, Jim sat down and started researching scripture and then came to me and said, what do you think about this? Of course, my first response was uh, Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula. I mean, you idiot. I mean, every Bible shows it's in the back of the mountain. So why spend the money and time going over there? So Jim came to me and says, hey, man, this is uh, this is really interesting because the Bible says just the opposite. I said, well, you got to be kidding. Where does it say this? So in the beautiful way that Jim did, and by the way, uh, just a, a great one of the greatest minds and, and, and people I've ever met um, came to me and said, uh, um, this, uh, this mountain should be in, the, in Saudi Arabia. And the Bible clearly says it. I said, well, show me where it says. He says, well, in Galatians 4.25, it says, now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. Well, that's not even vague. Uh, and Arabia has never been the Sinai Peninsula. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have tried to put it there in maps uh, and shown little lines going over there to justify that, to harmonize with the, that scriptural interpretation. But Mount Sinai, I mean, uh, the, the Arabia has never been in the Sinai Peninsula. Then we have another scriptural reference where it says when Moses met God of the burning bush, he was in the ancient land of Midian when he met God of the burning bush. And um, this was Mount Sinai. And so we need to find ancient land of Midian. Well, ancient land of Midian is in present-day Saudi Arabia, which was ancient Arabia. So we have two clear arrows from scripture pinpointing Mount Sinai as being in Arabia and not on the Sinai Peninsula. And we were wondering why in the world would someone ever, ever follow the tradition that Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula? Well, it all started 
way back in the third century when Queen Hel- Helena, who was the mother of Constantine, the emperor of Rome, she was over there. And as she had, has anointed other sites in the Holy Lands, she did her work there. So she went and, and, and gave these sites. And so today, a lot of these, a lot of these traditional sites, when you go to, to Jerusalem today, are because of her pointing them out and saying, this is the site. She liked doing that. So in the Sinai Peninsula, she went there and did the same thing. She said, this is Mount Sinai. And they built a, a monastery there called St. Catherine's Monastery. It's the, been the longest occupied uh, building in the world that has been continually oh, really? occupied is St. Catherine's Monastery. I didn't know it, that. It avoided, it yeah. avoided the, the Muslims going in there, never destroyed it. We have this incredible place in the Sinai Peninsula that is today, uh, if you go there, you'll see tourist shops uh, along the roads, and you'll see people hawking their wares and selling things. And you get in, you climb to the top of the mountain, you get M&Ms and a Coca-Cola <laughs> at the top and, and, and buy you know rocks from the mountain. It's really quite a commercial uh, affair, but it's really not the real Mount Sinai. The real Mount Sinai is in Arabia, as the Bible says. The real Mount Sinai is in the ancient land of Midian, which is Arabia, the Bible says. And we need to follow the ancient historians that specifically talk about it. You know, Flavius Josephus, Demetrius Philo, all said that the mountain should be uh, the highest mountain near the city of Madian. And the city of Madian has been clearly identified today as uh, Al-Bad. And the highest mountain near the city of Al-Bad is the mountain called Jabal al az which is the highest mountain in the region. literally means mountain of the almond or the almond tree, which has significance from Aaron, going back to Aaron. Mm-hmm. But this is the mountain of the almond, and uh, almond trees still grow on the mountain. By the way, it's the only mountain we could find over there where almond trees are growing. Uh, and it's surrounded by groves of acacia wood trees, which is what the trees were used to build mm-hmm. the Ark of the Covenant. Um, but it goes far beyond that, the evidence that we found, that would really point that this is the real Mount Sinai. Well, tell me about it. No, tell me about the. I think I first got exposed to this uh, before we met with the, Pen, with the Caldwells. They, they, uh, they stopped by uh, went, uh, many, many years ago. You Wonderful, know. dear, sweet people. Jim and very, Penny Caldwell are dear friends of mine, and, and uh, I fact, love I, them. I, I suspect that was the way we probably got connected. That's how we got together. Yeah, uh-huh. and, and they went and, uh, and followed the Bible didn't even know of me, um, completely separate, and they followed the Bible where it says Mount Sinai, you know, they, they were living over in the ancient land of Midian. They were living in Arabia. So they went out totally parallel with me, but totally didn't know what or, or, on my research, but a couple of years after I had been there, and they went over and went to this mountain, and they found the mountain to be an amazing mountain like I have. Um, this mountain over there is a very prominent mountain. It sticks up over the horizon. And as you drive up to it, you see this um, charred rock on top of this mountain, melted rock. And all the maps show this as being volcanic rock. So I was prepared not to be too excited because it just looked like a big volcano. And the top of it was melted black and the bottom of it was just granite. Climbed to the top of this mountain, Chuck, took the rocks, broke it open, and lo and behold, in the inside it's granite, on the outside it's melted black. Which now, means that the heat, the heat was externally it. supplied, uh, it, it, it wasn't absolutely it, it, an eruption. It was it was heat from <laughs> external. <laughs> yes, yeah. you can imagine. Now, me as an ex police investigator, I'm looking at this rock. Now, I'm I'm no rocket scientist, but I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at this rock on the inside. And I'm saying, wait a second, this is granite, and there's a rind going around the outside. That this crust that is melted black, and it's shiny black. And the silica had been melted in the rock from an external heat source. Well, I've shown this to other photos to people. Of course, I've had 50 different opinions from 50 different scholars as to what this is. And one person even said it was caused by a UFO coming down as a landing site with a laser beam. Um, <laughs> but how do you quantify God being melted? I mean, rocks being melted by God. I mean, there's not a scientific uh, comparison that you could have today. So I've had much different opinions on that. But the rock is melted. No one can argue that. And it is granite on the inside. And God said he descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace. So that was the first real clincher for me. And then around the mountain, we began to search more around the mountain. And sure enough, we found evidence that started springing up all around us. Well, I got to stop you for a minute, though, because people figure that uh, I can, they can they imagine you with packs just comfortably climbing up, uh, you know, in the wild here. Uh, you want to indicate about the barbed wire, the fencing, and the fact that this is a, <laughs> a policed military installation that you had to slip under the fence at night? I mean, <laughs> let's fill in the blanks here a little bit to give someone a perspective of this thing. Well, a lot of people want to talk about the adventure. I like to go right to the evidence, but there was a lot of adventure around it. And of course, um, we were uh, 
we're in a dangerous situation. I won't make light of that. Uh, they had fenced off this mountain. They have a guardhouse around the mountain. They have guards guarding this mountain. Now, you wonder why would the Saudis in the middle of nowhere guard a mountain that has melted rock on top? And that was pretty provocative to think, why are they protecting this mountain? And they have guards, and even the Caldwells have reported uh, there are snipers over there now. Uh, they're so serious about keeping people away. And that's why a lot of people may have not, might not have heard about this mountain until this radio broadcast, because it is such a secretive mountain. And um, I, I, can, I just can only guess that the Saudis know exactly what they have. They know that this is a great monument to Hebrew tradition and history, uh, that it would be great significance for the Christian world. Um, that would, they're, they're a very xenophobic country. They're very closed right now. They don't allow any Westerners to come over there as tourists and to wander around. And I think that they would just have a, a hornet's nest on their hand if, they ever, if this ever got to be anointed as the real Mount Sinai. So they're taking great precautions to keep people away. Um, and uh, we did have to go over there under the cloak of darkness because if we were caught on an archaeological site that was well marked uh, to keep away, the punishment would be beheading. And so um, even though I've been accused of not having much of a head to begin with <laughs> and a brain, it would certainly not be my choice. So I, I, we took grave precautions. We, we dressed as Bedouins. We lived in the rocks. I was out there for five days uh, in the rocks, a very harsh conditions, um, no heated food, um, staying with no shade during the day, um, really a dangerous situation. We, we, it was 127 degrees in the day in Jeddah the day we left there. So it was just a suffocating, a heat that just sucks the air out of your lungs. But we endured it. We did our reconnaissance work at night. Uh, we did reconnaissance work slip, slipping from rock to rock. Um, and what we found as we slipped around the fence going up the back with night scopes uh, was just astounding what is at that mountain. And no wonder they don't want the world to see this. Mm-hmm. Well, tell me some more of the evidence. As you ran, this is just the beginning. You have actually ran into a great deal of uh, discoveries surrounding the Mount Sinai, didn't you? Well, the, the Bible says uh, in Exodus 19.23, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. We know there's some kind of a boundary marker system to keep the people away from the mountain. So in the valley floor below that, we did find these boundary markers spaced every uh, 400 yards in a perfect two-mile semicircle going around the mountain. The rock piles were very weathered. They were exposed to wind and sand erosion, and they were quite smooth. And these cairns or markers were very precisely placed as if they were going to keep a large group of people away from the mountain as a, as a line of the delineation, a mm-hmm. very distinct mm-hmm. line of the delineation. It goes through the whole valley. Of course, if you had two million people out there, you'd need to have some pretty good markers to keep them away. And the Bible says that Moses to put, was to put limits around the mountain. Then the Bible says that um, when Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights getting uh, receiving the Ten Commandments from God, um, that, the, that the children of Israel rebelled, and they said it wasn't the God of uh, Israel that brought us out of Egypt. It was the God of Egypt. And so they reverted to their pagan ways. And having lived for 430 years in Egypt, they certainly had an influence on their culture that was strongly uh, influenced by the Egyptian worship practices. And they practiced worshiping a golden calf called Apis or Hathor. And so the Bible says they made for themselves an altar there. They made this golden calf. And we did find an altar uh, down in the valley below, a very prominent altar. It's 30 feet high and 30 feet across. Now get this. This is an area of the world where no one has ever lived. And we have this huge monument that's 30 feet high and 30 feet across with the ancient bull god inscribed around the outside of it. And the University of Riyadh has told us that these are Egyptian bull gods and it's ancient petroglyphs of an Egyptian bull god. Now, this is all up to interpretation from a lot of different people. Some people will look at this and say, well, it doesn't mean that at all. When I look at it, I see an altar having been there from a police mind that was built by hundreds or thousands of men for a very specific reason as an altar, and they put the bull god Apis on it. Now, you can do the math on that. That's probably, this is Mount Sinai, that's probably where they made the golden calf, and it was a huge altar. And, of course, they had the entire workforce of Pharaoh with them, and they were well-skilled in larger work projects. So they built this big altar, and that also had a fence around it with barbed wire and a sign saying, stay away. Then the Bible talks about at the foot of the mountain, uh, uh, that Moses was to build an altar with 12 stone pillars where they did burn offerings. Well, now we went right. The Bible specifically says here at the foot of the mountain. Now, the police mind says go to the foot of the mountain 
went to the exact foot of the mountain. There's only one place it can be where the mountain actually forms this little uh, U-shaped area where, the, where, where there's a little dry stream bed that comes out of there. And here is the foot of the mountain. And sure enough, right there, right on that imprint is a huge altar, 120 feet long. And not only is it 120 feet long, but it has a uh, an area there that has ancient ash in one of the pits that's about 12 feet by 12 feet that is ancient ash, where they did burn offerings. This is not a Muslim practice to do burn offerings uh, hmm. in, in, in their worship service. We have an ancient altar site, and we, then we found white stone pillars straddle, strewn all over the area, about 22 inches in diameter, about 20 inches tall, that were smooth round pillars that were strewn all down below this altar site, indicating to us that there was pillars at there at one time, perfectly dovetailing with what Scripture is telling us. Then the Bible talks about a split rock at Horeb, and this is where we have to give full credit to Jim and Penny Caldwell, who went over there, and to the great work that they did. There is a split rock over there on the side of the mountain, Jabal El Laws. Now, this is the, this is will give hair on the back of your head to stand up. They get a half an inch of rain every 10 years. Let this sink in. A half an inch of rain every 10 years. Very parched environment. Has been for as long as recorded history can tell us. This rock is split from top to bottom, 19 inches wide. It's 54 feet high and has a 19-inch laser split right down the middle of it. And at the bottom of it, you can see where water has erupted from this rock. It has gone down and washed over the mountainside and washed the, the solid granite boulders smooth all the way down to an ancient lake bed, a huge ancient lake bed. This is interesting. This is the area of the world that doesn't get hardly any rain. And yet the whole mountainside just in this spot is completely washed smooth. The Bible says that Moses struck the rock and water gushed out like gushing down from a river. The Bible specifically says the water gushed out and we have this rock that split and water erosion down next to it. And all these things start to add up as being incredible. And other things are like the Bible talks about the cave of Elijah on the mountain. There needs to be a cave on it where Elijah stood. There was a cave. Pretty soon, you start dealing, as a police officer, when you're dealing in a case, you're not dealing with absolutes a lot of times. You're dealing with degrees of probability to get a prosecution. This has so much evidence that is overwhelming that it's hard to turn your back on this as being the real Mount Sinai. Especially when you contrast it to the lack of any evidence and the, and the inappropriate topography of, of the traditional Mount Sinai. You get up there, there's really no evidence at all. In fact, there, there, you, you, uh, as I've uh, uh, seen your presentation on some of that, uh, there's no place for a camp for a large number of people. It's just not, it just, it, it just the, this, the, the physical description of the activities uh, in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, and visiting the site seem very, very uh, incompatible. Well, you, it, in doing computations to the size of the camp, if we use a two million person figure, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. could be true or it could be even be more than that, we'd have about a square yard per person that could fit in the tradi- at the traditional Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula. And also archaeologists, Israeli archaeologists, who you know are the finest in the world, I think, they were over there digging on the mountain. Uh, After the Six-Day War, they had 16 years where they did work over there, and their intent was to try and find evidence of the Exodus. And they dug that whole area, and they didn't find one pot, nothing, not a bone, not a button, not a Mm -hmm. tooth that would Mm -hmm. indicate that people had camped there. And you would have a lot of evidence today. Uh, the two million plus would have probably impacted the environment, just like we leave trash today. They'd have left a lot of pottery and burial sites and things like that to indicate that there was a large grouping there. And a lot of people say to me, "Well, wh- why is this evidence still there? And why is why can we even find this stuff? I mean, when we go to the Middle East; these these things are covered up with fifty to one hundred feet of dirt. Why did why are they just sitting on top of the land? Well, you know, when you're over in the Middle East and you find a a site, it's usually on a tell. It was originally on a flat ground. But it was destroyed, burned down, invaded, whatever reason, abandoned, earthquake. Then they build on top of that. Then they build on top of that. Then they build on top of that because it had a great strategic location by a stream or by a defensive position or on a trade route. And they keep building up and building up and building up. So you have 20, 30, 40, 100 feet layers of dirt. At this site, there's no layers. Why? Because a group of people came there, built the monuments, and then left and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. No subsequent civilization came in because there was no water and no food there. So we have evidence of a huge civilization being there, and then they just abandoned the site. What we find today, we would find exactly what you find there today. 
They were there quite a while, about a year, weren't they? A little right? less than a year. Little less just a little year. less than a year. And yeah. then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, another thing is, if Moses is wandering in the wilderness in the Sinai Peninsula, which is average width 80 miles, after 39 years, don't you think that Mrs. Moses would say, hey, let me look at the map for a while? I mean, how do you wander in the wilderness <laughs> for 40 years in a, in a peninsula that you can cover in a couple of days going either direction. I mean, sooner, you know, they had to have been in the Ruba Kali or the big Saudi desert. And when they did cross over into the Holy Land, what direction did they cross the Jordan? They crossed from the east going west, mm-hmm. which is mean that was the correct. Right, not going, from not, the, yeah, not, right. not going from north from the Sinai Peninsula. Right on, right on. Bob, you know, uh, 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 changing the subject here again, but... As a Naval Academy graduate, of course, I've been very fascinated with the writings of Luke because Luke uh, apparently was not only a physician. Some people believe he was a shipboard a physician. He certainly, he certainly knew seamanship. And in Acts 27, we have this incredible, I think it was Acts 27, uh, where, we, uh, where he has this uh, famous shipwreck. What makes that passage so interesting, aside from the adventure of it in terms of the narrative, uh, it also has so much uh, uh, seamanship detail that it's been a much studied, much uh, documented uh, passage. I've, I've uh, done some background on that myself. But I notice you've also had an interest in trying to determine some archaeological uh, uh, input from that article. Well, like, you know, it, it's, you know Luke uh, is so graphic. Uh, what a historian. And uh, he, he really uh, is, is, is a great help and a friend to anybody doing research in the Bible and especially here in marine archaeology. I mean, he gives us a blueprint of where he went. Um, Unfortunately, on um, Malta today, they have a bay which they call St. Paul's Bay. They have big statues there in churches, and they have ceremonies around it today. Unfortunately, um, the bay was anointed by a monk in about the year 1500, uh, in, in doing research over there, that's the only evidence we had that this is the bay. And then I started questioning, uh, you know, Paul, uh, you know, Luke was so precise in giving us wind directions and, and what happened on the ship and what happened just before the ship went aground uh, that it's hard not to be able to piece this together as a, as a police and, you know, background. Of course, my background is law enforcement, as we discussed earlier. Um, And so I looked at this as a police investigation, and then all of a sudden it was very clear to me that the bay where Paul came that wrecked on was not anywhere near the northern part of the island, but it had to have been in the southern part of the island. And this is after a lot of research, actually going out over there in Malta and going in the Mediterranean Sea and going out and working in the squid boats, the commercial squid boats, (laughs) talking to the sailors and going through that kind of work, sitting on cliffs and monitoring the waves and the in the rain and the driving wind and monitoring what happens during storms over there. And I came to the clear realization that where Paul came to rest in his shipwreck was not even in the northern part of the island, but in the southern part of the island, because uh, a lot of reasons for this. But um, one of the big reasons is that when when Paul uh, set off with with uh, with with the centurion and, and the crew, uh, he had a he was an Alexandrian grade f- grain freighter, and he is blown um, he is blown across uh, from Crete, and he's blown in a southern direction. Um, and they're worried about going on this, the, the shoals, the Citra Sands in the Gulf of Citra. And they're so fearful of being caught there because there's no water for, for miles and miles and miles. They'd certainly die of thirst. There's no active wells in that area that would supply water at that time. And also ancient lore talked about sea monsters being in the Gulf of Citra that the sailors were afraid of. And so they just did anything but go aground there. So they, the, the wind blew them south, and then they fought their way up in a northern direction, and which means they would have struck Malta going north northerly direction. And we know that they did not crash on the east side of the island because the sailors said they, they when they first saw the land that they could not recognize it. Now, this area on the east side of the island is, is where Valletta is today, this big, well-known harbor. In fact, it was a hub for all travel during the Mediterranean in those times. The sailors would have been well aware of the topography of the island. So they mentioned that they, were, that they couldn't recognize this, this land. Couldn't have been on the west side of the island because it's all cliffs. Mm -hmm. Uh, couldn't have been on the north side of the island because they were coming from south. So it leaves only really one bay, and that's the southern part of the bay of Marsha Schlock Bay today. Now, the interesting thing about Marsha Schlock Bay, 
today is that none of they, they looked at me like I was crazy when I suggested this as being the bay that Paul crashed on. But it fits with all the topography and, and description. The Bible says that as they were sailing, that they heard a reef or they heard they sensed that there was land. And we have a reef that's right off of shore there. Then they said that they went to 20 fathoms to 15 fathoms. We find that topography in the ocean there. Then they, they laid anchor there and they waited until the sun came up and then they made for shore. And, of course, um, we have the whole thing in Acts 27 played out very clearly that this is the probably the bay that they came to, that, that, that they crashed on. And now I'm trying to amass an expedition to go over there and get all this deep sea equipment, do all this high dollar stuff. Now, Bob Ballard might be able to get that kind of money and ability to do this. It's really hard to to gather this 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 kind of dollars for this, you know, this kind of uh, you know marine archaeology expedition. So um, we're we're hoping and praying that God will provide, and we're going to go over there and, and very aggressively try to retrieve the sea anchors, and we're very confident that we will find the shipwreck of Paul in this area. What do you think you'll find? What kind of sea anchors are we talking about? Well, there's two different kinds of opinions. We're talking about a grain freighter that was had, you know, 276 men on it. It was huge, and they transported large amounts of grain in between Egypt and Rome. Uh, they had a very active trading route. These grain freighters were well known in the area, and, and I've and I've seen uh, uh, the, some some caves you, over there. They have some graffiti showing these great sea freighters coming into port, and so we know what they look like. Very elegant looking, huge vessels, square rigged vessels. They would have had um, uh, probably either uh, the, the Romans had lead uh, used lead anchors or the, the the top piece that goes across. I don't know if that's called a spar or what mm-hmm. that is. That that piece that goes across that makes the T at the top. But those are those are lead. They're uh, in the museums over there in the Maritime Museums in Malta. They're about five feet long. They're about eight inches thick. Um, big, heavy uh, anchors, um, and uh, that's that could be what we'd find. Or uh, the the uh, we know that the Egyptians like to use isosceles triangle shaped stones that were dropped over like big anvils, and they anchored themselves. And these big ships had had multi anchors, uh, just as the Bible said. They didn't just drop over one like we have today, and our ships that just drop a big old anchor down and hang there, but. They actually dropped, some of them had up to 11 anchors that they would drop to keep them anchored offshore. And so we, we think that we will find a minimum of four, uh, possibly as much as six or eight in the area, because the Bible doesn't give us a specific amount on the forward part of the, the, the craft, but says they specifically dropped four from the, from the aft area of this ship. So we think that they'll be in about the 15 uh, fathom Part mm-hmm. of water that, which is about ninety feet of water, we should find them mm-hmm. totally, totally recoverable in that depth of water. That's very, very exciting. So, uh, you've got a plate pretty full of uh, options here, and uh, one of the other things I'd like to talk about, if we can, and this is probably the most colorful of all of these, and that is the Ark of the Covenant. You know, there's so much interest in the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, uh, anybody interested in the Bible is interested in the Ark of the Covenant. But also do the popular movie, Indiana Jones and all that. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant uh, has become a topic of household conversation. And uh, uh, why don't you ju- just jump into that one for me? Well, the Ark of the Covenant uh, is, is one of the greatest mysteries of all time because it was so widely talked about and written about in, in early Hebrew history. And then all of a sudden it just drops off from the face of the earth. Um, after it's placed in, in Solomon's temple... Uh, in about 955 B.C., some people argue that exact dating, but approximately right in there. It was placed in the Holy of Holies. So about 3,000 years ago, it's placed in there by Solomon. And then from that point on, we do not have anything written about what the disposition of the Ark of the Covenant is. We don't know where it went. But we have we have very clear clues from Scripture. If you really want to dig into Scripture and read uh, what the what the uh, inferences are in these verses, uh, it very clearly tells us that it was probably taken out of the temple during the time of Manasseh. And so we know, uh, we have a King Uzziah who reigned from 781 to 740 B.C. He actually uh, receives leprosy by burning incense at the entrance of the Holy of Holies. Um, so, and he's actually... He, he, he was a king from the tribe of Judah. He was express, expressly prohibited. He right. had to be from the tribe of Levi and a priest and so on and so forth, right? And the Bible says he was th- literally thrown out of there. I mean, he gets leprosy. Just burning incense, he gets leprosy. It's a really powerful 
implement we're talking about here. Then we talk about King Hezekiah, who's surrounded by uh, Sennacherib, the ancient Assyrian king, uh, in about the year 701 B.C., and uh, he prays to God. Uh, he, he, it says, after going up to the house of the Lord, uh, he prays, Lord of hosts of God of Israel that dwells between the cherubim. Thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of all the earth. So we can infer here, the Bible doesn't specifically say that the ark is there, but why is Hezekiah praying to, to God that dwells between the cherubim? Because we know that this is where God dwells. Above the mercy seat, between the wings on the cherubim, is where God dwells. And so now we have a specific indication that the ark is still there in 701 B.C. Now we have a unique king after that whose name is Manasseh. And boy, was he a bad king. This guy did everything horrible and despicable that you can even think about. Um, he built altars in the house of the Lord for all the host of heaven, and he made his sons pass through the fire, and he used enchantments and dealt with familiar wizards and so spirits. So he introduced, he introduced spiritism and paganism so, and all the rest of it. The Bible right. says that even the blood, the Bible specifically says that the blood flowed from one end of Jerusalem to the other of innocent people because of his despicable acts because of his despicable acts in the Holy of Holies. I believe the Levitical priests would not have stood for this. I mean, if they throw out King Uzziah just for bringing in incense, throw this king out, they surely would have stood up to Manasseh doing these crazy things. And so we believe that the ark was taken out during that time because there's a very strong reference after that with King Josiah, and he was 640 to 609 B.C., but he mentions in Second Chronicles 35, 2 through 3, he says, put the holy ark in the house which... Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. The burden on your shoulders refers to the ark is wandering. The Levites have it. It's out being carried somewhere outside probably of Jerusalem. And that the verb put the holy ark in the house literally means that the ark is not in there, that it's out and it's on the Levitical, the priest of the Levitical shoulders. So let me make sure I get this straight then, uh, Bob. Um, taking for granted that it was present in the days of Hezekiah, mm -hmm. from that point, when we, we, go, we go fast forward to the days of Josiah, it has disappeared. It is presumably still handled by Levites, but outside of the temple area, outside of Jerusalem altogether, perhaps who knows where, and that's right. part of what we'll get into. Because uh, we then in, when we get to Josiah, we enter into this strange episode with uh, Pharaoh Necho where they have the battle. You, I think that's very important if you want to highlight that. Okay. Um, yeah, King Josiah, uh, we, we have some references to King Josiah and why the ark would have been probably out during that time. Um, he, 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 he was receiving messages from Holda, who was a prophetess. And um, Holda told him. Which, which right there is a big significant, because if he, he shouldn't been getting, if the ark was around, he'd be getting the messages from, through, the, th through the Levites using the traditional. Absolutely. So uh, the very fact that he has to resort to a prophetess implies an absence of the ark, doesn't it? Bingo. You're right on top of this. That That is the key point. And when uh, the Bible says that she reported to Josiah, it says that God will bring a calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the books with the, which the kings of Judah had read. He says, it says in verse 20, it says, Surely therefore I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. Now we should make it clear that the calamity is being brought about as an echo of uh, uh, Manasseh. In other words, Manasseh's antics is what got, 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 has God angry. Josiah, is, Josiah was a pretty good guy. And the calamity isn't because of Josiah, it's because of his predecessor, isn't it? And it's an it's a, it's a extension of grace to him that he won't live to actually see the horror that God right. is going to bring upon the people. So that's, the key point, I think, for our listeners is to recognize that Josiah is, is absent the ark, that Josiah is anxious to somehow get the ark, but uh, God is telling him through the prophetess that he's not going to live to see the calamity that is coming upon the land. Right. Well, a lot of people feel that, that Josiah had the ark because he was preparing a place. He was preparing the temple. The Bible says that he's, he's preparing the temple. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, we, we don't know why he's preparing the temple. Because right the same verse where it says he's preparing the temple, he says immediately, once he was preparing the temple, that he went out uh, to fight against uh, King Necho, who was the pharaoh, uh, at Carchemish by the Euphrates. And so what happened there was a unique confrontation in that 
Josiah is stopped by Necho and saying, why are you coming out here to meddle with me? Um, Necho is saying that God is speaking to me. God is with me. And if you read in Scripture, he's very clear about saying God is with me and God is speaking to me. The unique situation here is, could the ark have been transported to Egypt? Could Necho have the ark? Could he be carrying it into battle to fulfill? And we don't know in, in history what that, what that purpose would be, but for, for some reason God would want this battle to take place and specifically spoke to Necho and told Josiah, don't mess with me. And Josiah did. He, he actually disguised himself, was killed by an archer, taken out of his chariot, put another chariot, taken back to Jerusalem, and there he was buried. So this was this is a really a unique situation in all history. Why is all this happening? So, if the ark was so, with Necho, it makes perfect sense. Josiah disobeyed. In other words, he was told that he would die. The prophet... The prophecy of the prophetess came true, that he did die then and did not see what subsequently happened. Because later on, Pharaoh Necho gets defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, does he? And that leads to the whole Babylonian captivity of Israel. But the speculation here is is that uh, 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 that uh, the that it's possible that the Levites had absconded the ark to Egypt and it somehow was a- available or the 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 because it says I've Necho says I've heard from the mouth of God as I recall isn't that what he says there? Well, the literal translation is did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God. That's right out of the Bible, and, and so, this this yeah. phrase is incredibly revealing. Well, especially because here we have a Gentile king able to hear the mouth of God in a condition that's that is apparently consistent with God's intention, namely that he would be an instrument of 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 this calamity that God is has prophesied would come upon Jerusalem. Well, Exodus twenty five twenty two says, And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony. So we know that God's method of communication from the ark is a distinct voice being carried from between the cherubim. So if he does have the ark <laughs> and he's hearing the voice of God, it's very, it's very that's, provocative. That's really wild. I mean, it's hard for us to... To, to, to imagine that. Yeah, that's exactly what the scripture is expressly says. And it's interesting because right at the time of Manasseh, who was this horrible king, we know of a temple built on Elephantine Island in Egypt, where, of course, Necho would be. The, it was one of the, the, the leading trade capitals in all Egypt was uh, Elephantine Island by Aswan Dam today. And, and so archaeologists have dug up in the late 1800s papyri. Secular archaeologists talking about the the, the a colony of Jews coming there during the time of Manasseh, building a temple the same size as Solomon's temple, doing worship there, and actually communicating to Jerusalem, saying, how do we do worshiping on this island with blood sacrifices? This is interesting because this violates the Deuteronomic laws, and it also violates the mandates of Josiah not doing blood sacrifices outside of Jerusalem. So we have a unique situation where priests are almost pleading with these papyri and these pottery shards that have been found by secular archaeologists saying, how do we do blood sacrifices? And this violates the, the, the laws, the Deuteronomic laws and the laws and mandates of Josiah. So we have a temple there that was built, and now I go over to this, this island. I meet with the curator of the museum, Dr. Hanna, the museum over there. He tells me and almost knocks me over and says, yes, we have found writings that indicate that the ark came to this island during the time of Manasseh, and then it was taken up after the temple was destroyed in 410 B.C., up into Nubia and into Ethiopia, where it is today, up into Abyssinia. This almost blew me over when a leading scholar in Egypt told me this. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, continue the tracking then. So the ark, let's let's, uh, give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume that tradition is correct, that the ark actually was there and then moved. What happens next? Well, the ark was taken up onto an island in Ethiopia called Lake uh, Tanakirkos Island. Tanakirkos Island is considered to be a holy mountain. Just up until a couple of years ago, it was off limits to anybody visiting it. I procured a uh, permission from the Ministry of Tourism. They sent a representative with me. I went by boat, this tiny little boat, out to this island, not knowing what I would find. And when I, re- when I got on this island, I was amazed to find that the monks out there uh, say that they have been there since 400 B.C., that they have an unbroken chain of occupancy since that time, that they worship on this island where the ark was. They said the ark sat on a rock cliff area. They showed me. uh, They said the ark was in a tent. I dug with my knife. I excavated the dirt off the top of this area and found four holes. 
socket holes where there would have been a tent there, spaced every 13 feet. Now, this this uh, structure was facing north-south like the temple was or the tabernacle was in the wilderness, east-west, north-south. Um, there was two big granite bowls that were covered, covered in moss, showing that they were very ancient in antiquity. And that they said that these were the blood bowls that were used during the blood sacrificial ceremonies, that the priest would throw the blood on the ark seven times with the tip of the finger of the, the priest or dipping the horse's hair into the blood, uh, which follows the ancient Hebrew practices in front of the ark. Um, they said that they had meat forks there that were from uh, the time of from Solomon's temple that they had with them that were used to stick in the meat and then put the meat on the fire. They showed me these big bowls that they were called gomers that they said were from blood sacrificial ceremonies. They had all these artifacts on this island that literally is mud huts and grass. And it was amazing to me that they still had this. I said, well, why, you know, why do you still have this implements? They said, well, uh, we collected them. We've saved them since that time. We ha- these are the original artifacts. But in the year 338 A.D., the country was converted to Christianity. A Syrian monk named Abba Salama came down, converted the King Izana to Christianity. He came to the island, stole the ark from us, took it to Aksum, and placed it in a church there where it is today. But in 338 A.D., the ark was taken from us, and because he was Christian, because they no longer did the blood sacrificial ceremonies, they left the implements here on the island. Now, it's interesting because around the island today, Lake Tana today, there is still a Jewish colonies that live around the island that say that they are descendants from the Jews that brought the ark, and they still practice an ancient form of Judaism. Today, I was at their village no more than two weeks ago talking to their leaders and hearing the story about them bringing the ark from Aswan, bringing it to Lake Tana, and they still practice Judaism today in this area. So they're, they're, they call themselves Beta Israel, um, is their name, which means House of uh, Israel. And they still practice Jewish faith today, and they say they're descendants that brought the Ark of the Covenant, which is just fascinating to me. It really is. Well, that brings us then to Aksum. Let's uh, tell us what we find in Aksum. Then you've been, you've been back to Ethiopia how many times? This is my fourth trip. Uh-huh. Uh, recently, I, I, I've taken doctors in, uh, medicine in each trip. I've cultivated a very deep relationship with the Ethiopian people, and especially the the, the, the spiritual leaders over there. I have come to just really love these people. They have uh, their motives are pure. They're good people. They're they're wonderful hearts, and uh, um, literally fall in love with the Ethiopian people. And they have uh, embraced me back, and I have br- brought them medicine, like I said, and 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 they tell me things that that they will not tell Westerners. I have gone to the next level, so to speak, in mm-hmm. in corporate terms. They are now revealing things to me. Um, that I'm just amazed at, which really help in our research. And these, these, the, what they're revealing to me about the Ark of the Covenant is, is astounding. They believe that they have the original Ark of the Covenant. I'll tell you that. We still have a great mystery here, but I think the most logical would be Ethiopia. It's the only country in the world today that has a living legend of the Ark being there. And more specifically, I met with the president a couple weeks ago. The president of the nation. The president it? of the nation. I presented him with Mary Irwin from the High Fly Foundation, a flag that went to the moon. Uh, Nagato, Dr. Nagato, phenomenal man. Um, went to the palace, a pretty, pretty posh environment. A great, uh, we had to meet with the protocol officers and were taken there by the motorcade and it was pretty heady stuff. But uh, you know me, I'm not afraid to ask any questions. <laughs> so uh, I went up to the president, introduced myself, and then said, do you believe that you have the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia? Of course, a uh, country of 60 million people, I'm sure he has more things to worry about than the Ark of the Covenant in a small little village in Axum. And he kept my hand clasped, and he leaned forward, and he says, Mr. Cornuck, I'm the president of Ethiopia. I do not think that we have the Ark of the Covenant. I know we have the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. He knows he has the ark, he said. And I just took him at his word that he has the ability and context to verify such a, such a claim. But he says, we do have the holy ark of the covenant. The preceding was a conversation between Chuck Missler and Bob Cornuke, author of The Mountain of God, The Discovery of the Real Mount Sinai.